another episode of the Ice Team Podcast. We got a familiar face with us again, uh, Mr. Matt Brewer. You have seen him before. He's been a part of Ice Team for decades, um, not to age him. You're not even that old. We're about the same age. We go way back. We can't tell 90% of the stories that we partook in when we were in college, but maybe we'll peel back the onion on one or two. But we're going to jump into a bunch of things. We got cold weather coming. Finally. Yep. I mean, you're in Bemidji. And if you look at the 10-day forecast, we're going to make some ice. Yeah, we were talking before we started here. I uh, got off work the other day and was driving home, and if it weren't for some geese in the middle of a little pond, it would have been completely frozen over, but the edges were completely ice. It yeah. was kind of exciting. It was the first first vision of it for the season. So, Did you walk on it yet? <laughs> I didn't quite have that temptation. <laughs> but did, did you walk through the showroom yet? I did. Did you see your big mug on the wall? Yeah, it's really humbling to look at a 30 foot tall picture of yourself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's uh, You've made quite it. impressive. Yes. But for uh, like half a lifetime of age under me, I, I still look pretty good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Not too bad, Brewer. How do yeah. you do it? Is it just the northern cold air? Yeah. 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 So much shivering. Uh, oh, just, you burn calories just yep, shaking just and staying alive. To gain weight. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it's funny you mentioned that because I was talking to somebody last weekend at a show, and uh, I kind of agree with this. He was saying how he's in better shape during the winter than he is in the summer as a fishing guide. Oh, yeah. Because of he's like, oh, I work five times harder on the ice, running around, moving, shaking. I eat less. And just because we're not, like, physically sweating in the sun like we do in the summer doesn't mean you're not – shedding calories and staying fit and you know especially years with snow i mean i know like i'm not exhausted after a day guiding in the boat like i am after a day of ice fishing right i mean makes a difference yeah i, d- I definitely agree with that i'm probably in the best shape of my year in march toward the end of ice season like running rentals you know propane tanks and batteries and not a lot of sleep mm-hmm. <laughs> there's a, a trudging through snow and slush it's that's a, that's a lot of work. I'm CNJ. total opposite. Yeah. I, I don't do the guiding thing, but like this time of year, when I can tell when the days get shorter, like you wake up in the morning and you're like, oh, it's still dark out. Mm-hmm. It doesn't feel like I should be up yet. Where in July, I'm like buzzing at like six o'clock, like up doing stuff, walking, might go lift a weight or something. This time of year, I'm just like, oh, God. Yeah. But we haven't had ice yet. So once ice kicks in, then I'll be actually moving more. And I you guys think. hunt. I don't do any hunting, but both of you, you've been out hunting already, I know. And oh, yeah. and uh, I know, Matt, you were saying you've already got a deer or more than one. I don't remember. How many did you? I, well, I got some deer, like uh, Texas deer. Yeah, okay, got <laughs> so, it. So my, my season started very early. Yeah. Um, uh, and it was good enough that I, I'm not even deer hunting this year. I bought a tag, but uh, Tade shot a nice buck mm-hmm. and, uh, and my daughter shot, shot her first deer this year. So... We definitely don't need the meat, and I'm in no hurry to, Just to stay clean another deer. Stay out of the deer ticks, right? Yeah, yeah it's you terrible. Saying, I've never, so I was like, this year, I'm like, I'm going to shoot a grouse with my dogs. Like, I'm going to learn how to do this. And I'm like, well, I don't really know what I'm doing, but I do know that I need to go into the woods. Yeah. Or at least walk down a logging trail, yep. you know? And I walk down the logging trail, and we are covered in, like, at least 50 deer ticks every single time. And it's mostly nymphs, so they're just yeah. like the tiny little dots. It's like pinheads. actually terrifying. Yeah. Like I went and bought permethrin a couple of weeks ago and sprayed everything down mm-hmm. on, on myself, but like my dogs get twice as much as I do. Like I picked off at least 60 from my dog in like a one hour walk. Yeah. And we didn't even go like into the woods because we got back to the where I wanted to go walk for grouse. And then I looked at him and I was like, oh my God, dude. How, do you, I, how do you get all? Because you have long hair. You have... You know, your dogs, it's not like you can man. see them. I don't lint roll it. They all kind of go to their head yeah, right away. Like they crawl up, go to their head and I, it's his whole head was just crawling and teeming with them. So I took a lint roller and just started wiping them. And I kept like getting like 10 each swipe, just throwing it away. And then, uh, then you start picking more on their legs. And then I'm like, dude, you're just going to have to jump in the lake and we're going to soap you down with some tick shampoo. Yeah. And, and that's kind of all we did. And it's weird mm. because, and a lot of people don't understand this, but like you can go all summer, like during the heat of the day, you know, going into fall and never see a tick. No. And then once you get that like first really cold night, it's like that's when those nymphs pop and the, yeah. net, the nests go. And then 
Hmm. And then they're also clumped together. So if your dog walks through a nest or you walk through a nest, you're not looking at like, I have a deer tick. You're like, I have, I have all five. of the deer ticks. Yes. Yeah. It's disgusting. I didn't know that. I guess I thought as it got colder, it would be the opposite. Oh. It's not cold enough yet though. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. have that, that section between it's getting cold now to it's freezing. That's when the deer ticks are the worst. Yeah. Hmm. And they, I've noticed that this might not be true, but every, when I'm walking on a trail, whether it's a game trail or a logging trail, I pick up more ticks doing that than I do just trailblazing through the woods. And I think it's because they probably hitch a ride from a deer or an animal and they drop right there, lay their eggs and then hatch on the trail. Right. They like to be that, on like regrowth, which is yes. typically on the edges. So, you know, those trees that are abundant with catkins, you know, like a, any, any kind of cutting. So the edges of trails are always cutting. So you've got those shorter bushes Yep. and those are always teeming with them. And as you get deeper into the woods, you see less of that. So you see less ticks. Yeah. No, mm. it's been bad. Like I've, I've never seen this many in my life. Normally I'm lucky to see a couple of year on me. I'm pretty stingy on like, I check myself. Like the last thing I want is Lyme's disease, you know, so I'm checking myself every day, no matter what. But this year I was like freaked out. Yeah. to even go in the woods. I'm like, this is disgusting. Do all deer ticks have carry Lyme disease? or So, like, if they're this juvenile, if they're literally the nymphs, are, are they even... They can carry it. They yeah. can? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I didn't so know if there was a certain period of time or how it works. or It's like a 16 to 18-hour inoculation, so they need to be on your body for a long time uh, for them they to need transmit to, it. Yeah, um, like defecate on your body, right? Because they, they're actually attached to you, and they suck your blood, and they actually, like, Defecate, correct? Poop? Oh Poop my on your body. <laughs> this is getting I real, think they do. Really real quick. I looked at this. I'm, dude, I would hate deer ticks, man. Uh, so basically, the moral of the story is if you check yourself at least once a day, yeah. you should be good. But they and, are tiny, man. And don't get pooped on by a deer and don't tick. Don't get pooped on. That okay. could be false. If you if find if you yeah. find one buried, you take it in, they'll take it off and they'll actually test it and then let you know if you need treatment or not. Okay. Yeah. So, so I've been treated for limes twice now and... I wouldn't doubt if I have anaplasmosis. Like, it's yeah. just, they're so thick. Yeah. And you can't catch them all. Like, I have ingrown hairs on my legs that are larger than the size of these nymphs. So, yeah. yeah. Well, you got hairy legs. I do. So, to be fair, we were, when we got back from up north too, it was like two days later, found one just crawling on me. I'm sure it was in my car or it was on my dog still. My dog, when they attach to my dogs, they die immediately. Or within a day or so, like they use like Brevecta or something. Uh, Simpiria trio. Yeah. So like they they will die when they bite my dogs, but still there can be a hundred on him, and they could just fall off, no problem. Then crawl up on, on your leg, and then you're not even thinking. Two days later, you got a deer tick crawling on you. Yeah. And that what it would make me the most nervous. That would be it. Like I think I could find the ones that were on me. I would think maybe not, but like Dude, your animals are bringing them into your house, and you don't know. And you go lay on the couch and watch a movie or right. whatever, well, and all of a sudden thinking. you go, correct. Like, that's yeah. the stuff that would make me, like, I always feel like if I leave the woods, I'm pretty good at, like, finding ticks on me or my dog if we see them. Now, I'm not, not doing the infestation deer tick thing you guys are talking about, but but then you, what you don't know is, like, okay, now did my dog bring in, like, 16 of these ticks right. into the basement kid's bedroom? Oh, yeah. And uh, that would be that would be the only time I get anxiety over the tick thing what? is, like, when I oh got boy. out of the woods the other day, I like took my jacket off, my orange jacket. Inside my jacket, I had like six or seven of them things just crawling around. That was inside my jacket. And I look at my t-shirt, I'm like, oh my God, they're on my shoulders. Yeah. You know, then I get back later to the house and I was like, well, there's one on my leg. Like yeah. scratched him off quick. He wasn't on there long, but you just don't think about that. Mm. I don't know if I've ever had a deer tick on. Maybe I have, but I mean, standard ticks. I mean, we see them a lot early in the spring, early summer, and then yeah. they die off. But yeah. I know there's times where like, I'm picking them off our dog all the time, it, but not the deer tick thing. I don't, don't did, mess with that. I think it's cause the winter we had last year wasn't too bad. Like it didn't freeze them out maybe. Right. Like, you know, yeah, more than I do up North, but possible. it wasn't, I mean, they go dormant in the winter. So yeah. I, I think they lasted a lot longer and I don't know. They're, they're, they're always bad, but this year they just seemed we have you, you guys, Have you guys had a good, like, two days of frost up north yet? Like, we, I know we've had We've had one. a couple overnights that frosted, yep. Yeah, but it still gets, like, 50-ish during the day, like. And they'll still be out. I know. Yeah, they're we need, nasty. like, cold, cold. Yeah, next week. Yes. Looking at the 10-day forecast, we're making ice next week. Yep. Which is mm -hmm. awesome. I mean, I think it was a buzz last weekend, and it was a more of a buzz this week. 
now that people actually see it physically. Everyone wants to see and know and, and all, seeing is believing. You look at all these 10-day forecasts, even here in the Twin Cities, like there's ice potential being made at the end of the 10-day forecast. So I'm pumped up. I mean, historically, we've always said Thanksgiving, right? Yeah. If we can get some ice to be formed around Thanksgiving, that's what we want to see. That's when we get the blood pumped. And then we're kind of right there. Yeah. When we talked about it at lunch today, like there's a chance you may see some people walking on some smaller bodies of water by Thanksgiving in northern Minnesota. Now, that being said, don't just go out there and walk on it. No. You know, still do your due diligence, do your checking, uh, check the ice conditions, but all signs pointing towards cold weather is coming. Yeah, I would I would guess if I wanted to, I could keep the tradition, the old tradition. It's not so much anymore, but you remember the old days, like yeah. I, I want to be on the ice by Thanksgiving. Yeah. And I would guess I can probably, you know, put put a foot on some ice by Thanksgiving. I don't know if I'll be fishing, right? But uh, but we're getting there, yeah. Which is a heck of a lot better than last year. So. Yeah, yeah. So no, we're pumped up. We got show season going hot and heavy. We're already halfway through some of the shows. Matt, I know you're going to be at a bunch of shows, a bunch of different events. Um, you're giving a seminar at Thorn or at uh, St. Paul Ice Show on on undesirables. Now, is that are you referencing me and Drew or yes. what? What's undesirable? Yeah, it's people you don't want to fish with. So <laughs> mostly also, you two. Not to bring back the Drew's got some facts, but apparently it's through their bacteria, which maybe that's poop, maybe not. I would say there's bacteria in poop. I don't know how it works, but <laughs> if the deer ticks are on you for 24 hours, you're going to get their bacteria on you, and hopefully, if you do have one on for you for 24 hours, it's not one that has Lyme's disease, right? End of story. So Just, bacteria is, is a slang term probably in that to be PC for poop. Sure. Maybe. I like, don't know. Just don't you're probably it, right. You're probably actually right. You. Yeah. yeah. Just actually. clean yourself. You know, get them deer ticks off. Leave them in the woods. Yeah. yeah. Or get chickens like we did this year. And they'll eat the deer ticks in your yard. Ooh. So what is the purpose of a deer tick? Uh, it's a parasite, man. The purpose for me? It's like a leech. The thing, the thing, only benefit I see to them is they feed chicks so and not like not like hot <laughs> chicks oh like grouse <laughs> like grouse chicks turkey chicks um you know they eat them yeah like very very young birds they feast mostly off bugs and insects and things like that so like in the back side of my pasture um i've just got a small little hobby farm but my back pasture is all tall grass and and like native prairie grass and after hens have poults the turkeys those poults are back there constantly picking away at all these weeds and i know they're eating ticks hmm. and, and grasshoppers and things like that oh, but yeah yeah makes uh, sense circle uh, of life otherwise they just poop on people yeah <laughs> poop on people and eat blood <laughs> drink blood whatever uh yeah. ticks ticks are gross now i'm gonna whatever. i feel all kind of gross now. yeah now let's, let's move on <laughs> move on yeah the, move they on are in ticks. undesirables and yes. uh and to segue into the seminar and a lot of what i like to do in the winter is um, I, I've found it like peaceful and satisfying to target fish that people just don't really care about. And I know burbot have made a huge, mm -hmm. huge push. And, you know, 10 years ago I would talk about burbot fishing and people would be like, oh, we just throw those things on the ice. And, you know, it's, it's really come full circle. Mm -hmm. And I, I like to think there's a lot of people like me who were passionate about it and kind of brought awareness to it. And, um, but, but I have to admit, it's a little tougher to catch them now because there's a lot of people targeting them. But, mm -hmm. but fish like that, or even like rock bass, yeah. you know, something that someone catches and they're like, oh, I hate rock bass. Well, have you ever gone and tried to catch like state record size rock bass? Mm -hmm. It's fun when you actually try to target Tom them. Tom did that last weekend on Mille Lacs. Yeah. He Kinda might have been trying to catch smallmouth and walleye and only could catch rock bass, but. He well, didn't. He didn't have a bad time. But once you turn it into, I want to catch these <laughs> and I want to get a big one, then it it gets fun. Yeah. So, or when you're sight fishing for bluegills and a rock bass comes in, you think it's a big bluegill. Yeah, that's that's not the that opposite <laughs> of what we're talking about. <laughs> Undesirable. <laughs> oh, we used to have that happen a lot. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. Continue. <laughs> <laughs> no, rock bass are fun though. We we don't have as many rock bass lakes in the twin cities we have some down here and, and ironically enough there's lakes down here that i could see possibly state record potential fish coming out of but i never understood why rock bass get a bad name i, I, I never copy i mean we love to target panfish of all kinds right bluegills crappies like we, we religiously target those species i would say that catching rock bass consistently is more difficult than 
crappies and bluegills and a lot of bodies of water. They fight hard. Oh, yeah. They taste fine. Mm-hmm. Everyone that says they don't taste good, I guarantee you don't know the difference. If I put it with a bunch of bluegills and crappies, you just munch it if we deep fried it. So I've never understood the whole like rock bass. No, I don't want to deal with them mentality because I've always thought they're a fun species to target as well. I don't know if it's a, uh, it's a look thing. Like they're, they're, they're neat in their own way, but they're it's kind of, kind of bumpy and drab. And yeah. They have the cool know. red eye, but it's a little grouper. It's not like a beautiful yeah, but deal. I don't like catching grouper either. <laughs> True. Yeah, like if I go saltwater fishing, I'm going after sharks or something, but yeah. um, cleaning them though, it, like we clean a lot of them in the Bemidji area because we, let's just be honest. We have a lot of clients who just want to fill they want a fish fry. Yeah, they want as many fish fries mm-hmm. during their week's day as possible. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. so we'll clean some up and cleaning them. They're pretty bloody fish. They're very bony. Um, you know, they're not the easiest thing to clean, not the prettiest thing to clean. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't know exactly what it is because they do fight like crazy. They're actually hard to target at times. Um, it's like yeah. a white bass kind of too. Yeah. I mean, when you yeah. think about it. Yeah, yeah. A lot, some white bass people are who blast. are into white bass love white bass. Right. But a lot of Shout people, out to Danny Vu. Danny Vu. A lot of people <laughs> are thing. like, oh, bloodline, you know, muddy, whatever. It's like, well, I don't know. I think it tasted pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. I, I, you know what? I'm going to go target rock bass this winter more. We're going to start a trend. Well, you already started the trend. You're actually giving a seminar on the trend <laughs> at the St. Paul Ice Show. So the trend's been started, but I'm going to go try to catch. I know where some big rock bass are. What do you I think, Drew? A couple, yeah. You go chase some rock bass? Yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> look at him. I'm thinking like, God, all the cool Foreman. things. I know what he wants to say. Right. I told Tom the other day, I was like, dude, the, th- the three things I want to do this year is I want to go to Lake Winnipeg because I think that's really awesome. I want to do Red Lake for crappies and I want to do Lake of the Woods Pike, which are pretty obvious ones. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you got, Brew, you've probably done that all enough to where you don't even care about it. Right. But I promise you, Matt, I probably won't go chase rock bass if I have one of those three options on the table. But if it's like, uh, I, I don't know. You're so I, stereotypical. I'm sorry, boys. I, greenbacks. Like you read it in Fisherman Magazine. Three inch right. pike, uh, like 14 inch crappies one after another, or rock bass. I'm like, oh. I've done that a few times. You're like a fish. You ever fish red lake crappies? I'm before? like your stereotypical Man. ice fisherman. <laughs> if I have to look at another red lake crappie in my lifetime, I just will fish rock bass the rest of my life. <laughs> Yeah, that's like, why you fish the undesirables. Yeah, do you know how yeah. many red You've light crappies I've cleaned? You've transpired to this different level. Lifetime? I'm still like down here. You're already over the hump. Well, I'm not over the hump. It's you're, just you're over the hump. Yeah, <laughs> I'm over the. Hump. I'm still climbing. Yeah, I just grew up, you know, it, like cut my teeth on all those things, like Lake of the Woods yeah. Pike. Like I remember as a kid, <laughs> when you'd go try to spear pike out of the ditches before you know mm-hmm. in the spring after after the 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 ice run. Like, and limit on crappies back then was like 15 and maybe even 20. Or even I think 20. when we were a little, yeah. I can't remember, but it was more than 10. Well, did we really count? Let's be honest. You just kind of throw well, them in the Northern bucket. Minnesota math is different than ours here in the it's Twin Cities. Very so. true. Very true. <laughs> <laughs> but like growing up up there, you know, I was born in Roseau and grew up fishing like the woods, Rainy River. So there's a lot of people now, like I know you love sturgeon. Yeah, and I've always loved sturgeon. I always will. They're really one of those top fish in my heart. But like you know, I was like eight years old catching sturgeon, and my dad would be like, "Cut, Cut the, the line, line. yeah, you know, and wasting so, your time." So these are things I grew up with. Yeah, you know, you didn't grow up with them, so I understand the appeal. I know, but man, just can't be as special as you, I guess. I just want to catch rock bass. <laughs> 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 okay. You can have it. <laughs> uh, we digress. Yeah. But like tulabies, whitefish, you know, things. And you've got your select groups that love those things. But, you know, these are things in Minnesota that really just aren't targeted that hard. And and if I can go target them and I'm all by myself on a spot and, you know, I'm kind of a recluse. So what would you guys <laughs> say is like the king fish that people want to target in Minnesota? Because I... Uh, at heart, I feel like walleye is still it, even though a lot of people catch crappies and bluegills. But I think if you have to pick walleye's one, not, walleye's king. it's got to be walleye. Walleye's king. Has to be. Yeah, I can tell. Well, you. I know there's more crappie fishermen than walleye fishermen. If, but is that because like five would, times over? If they had their option to catch a walleye or a crappie, what do you think they're going to choose? Maybe. Yeah. I just know when they do, every time they do the national polls, crappie, even state polls like panfish drastically out punt 
any other game fish. But I think when you ask more than your weekend warrior, it's probably a different scenario. But you might you may nail it. Like maybe the average angler that's taking that pole or getting a, a license um, doesn't have a boat doesn't have a motor on their boat if they do have a boat and they're limited to trying to catch bluegills and crappies and things of that nature. And in general, walleyes aren't easy to catch, especially if you're from down Southern Minnesota or, you know, Southern half. Like if you gave every person who bought a license in the state an option to catch or have a guided walleye trip or a guided crappie trip, I think they'd probably pick walleye. And that's kind of what I was basing my answer off is like my phone rings and I have some people that are like rock bass. (laughs) no, Oh. For, unfortunately, that'd be, the, that'd be the greatest money day of my life. Um, I have people who call and they're like, I know that walleyes are really hard to catch, but if we could catch one walleye, that'd be really cool. And I'm like, I'm like, oh, the guy that called before you just called and he wants to catch 37 walleyes <laughs> in the first hour. So, but everybody, everybody that calls me, even if they want a trip for something else, they're like, and if we can catch a walleye, that'd be great. So yeah. You know, we even see it in the Twin Cities. And the Twin Cities is not walleye capital no. of Minnesota. And we still get clients who are like, eh, we'll go back. Hey, I think we can get a walleye or two. Like, that'd be great. Like, and multiple times, no. Yeah. Honestly. Like, and we try sometimes and it's not happening. Yeah. But question to go back a little bit to what you said. You mentioned if you're chasing tulipy or rock bass and you have a spot to yourself, even better. Do you find that the case? When you get on a good tulipy bite that you're not next to people or a good rock bat bite? Or, or do you find that some of these fish and better fish in those categories are amongst other fish. So, I mean, like if you get on a really good tulipy bite in dead of winter, are you probably off by yourself someplace else, different structure, different probably, part of the lake? Depending on the lake. Um, you know, like if I go to leech and I hit a couple of my tulipy spots out there, or there's a couple of spots where white fish like to roam, um, likely I'm going to run into someone else. Um, you know, someone going after a big walleye, like a trophy walleye, or someone going after good pods of perch. Um, but like if I'm on Bemidji or, um, you know, some of the smaller lakes that, that contain good numbers of tulipies, I won't, I probably won't see another person unless they're driving by. Yeah. But like, you know, even Winnie, you're going to find the perch fishermen mixed in, the walleye fishermen mixed in. Um, but I guess I'm kind of basing it off of the, the lakes I fish the most and, and yeah, if I go chase tulipies on Bemidji, it's like me and one other guy. <laughs> like we're the only two people. Are they people. big out there? Yeah, they're like just giants. Big musky yeah. caliber eating. Yeah, like, like 18, 18, 18 and a half inches. Jeez. So, you know, it's not like Malax tulipies where you're getting ten to fourteens. These are these are megas. They're and, and how are the how's the tulipy fishing on leech and winnie and casks? I know we used to do that twenty some years ago. Yeah. And we'd catch a lot of big ones. Is it still that they're still giant pot? Because I know the Malax tulipy population People don't even target them much anymore. No, and I know the people that do said the size has drastically uh, decreased. Absolutely. Like, so it, what's, the, what's the status on, like, leech, winnie, cass? Leech, winnie, cass, I think, is still very, very good. Okay. Um, winnie is probably taking a little bit of a hit, and and leech, uh, I think, has taken somewhat, somewhat of a hit, too. They really like one area, <laughs> um, and... Anyone who's listening who knows Leech knows that area, and mm-hmm. uh, and they do get hit pretty hard. Like, I could never go to Leech and hit one of the community holes and probably be by myself. And guys and gals are catching these and smoking them. Yeah. It seems to be the ter- the trend. I see a lot of people, when they're catching these tulipies, they're bringing them home for the smoker. Yep. Cut More that, often than not. Cut the head off, cut them out, throw them on the smoker. That's, that's what I do. They're yeah. good. Yeah, they're delicious. Really good. On the, I mean, it's one of my favorite smoked fish. Yep. Very good. Tulipy. Now, you mentioned white fish different than the tulipy if, if you're listening or watching um and you're catching those on some lakes too. those are i remember funny story long long time ago pete riola we went to schwamigan bay lake superior like in 2001 2002 we were chasing smallmouth through the ice yeah that was fun and uh i caught a lake white fish yep didn't know they existed at that time looks a lot like a tulipy and on schwamigan probably you're looking at like a four to six pounder yep and i looked at pete and Pete looked at me and we're like, we just caught the state record tulipy. <laughs> yeah. It was, so, dude, it was like 25 inches long yep. and it looked just like, it didn't have the snout like you hear about. It looked just like a tulipy. Mm-hmm. And I had no clue. And it was Pete's buddy came walking over and he's laughing. He's like, you morons. Like that's a whitefish. Yep. And we're like, 
what's Same the di- thing? I had no idea. Yeah, I, yeah. I was the probably a little different. Or something. Yeah, I was probably yeah. 18, 19 years old. I didn't know. I had not caught one like that. I I had caught tulipy yep. on Winnie and Lake of the Woods and Mille Lacs. That's all I've ever caught. I never caught a whitefish. And God, he burst my bubble. But I ate that darn thing. And that was, I remember to this yep. day, it was so good. Yeah, and whitefish, you can use so out. good. We, Excellent bait. We yeah. filleted some in the boundary waters and they were really good. Yeah, it was wonderful. What are the ones they got on red? Are those are moon eyes or gold eyes? Was uh, the little teeth? Gold eyes, I believe, on red. Yeah. Caught a couple of those last year. Those are cool little things. Yeah, they're neat. Yeah. It's got like those two little vampire teeth on them. Yeah, we used to fish them a lot when I was a kid. And uh, and actually, even as an adult, you, you'd catch them for bait because they're awesome cut bait for, for catfish on the Red River. So, um, you know, growing up where I did, I fished the Red River for cats a lot and, and even walleyes. But... Um, but yeah, excellent, excellent. I think we're on to something for Brewer's new guide service here. <laughs> Gold eyes, <laughs> rock Moon cut bait, rock Moon bass. eyes, rock bass. We might take a trip to the Red River and catch a catfish. If you're undesirable, yeah. looking for an undesirable, <laughs> contact Matt Brewer. <laughs> I think we got a, we got a tagline here for your guide business. Well, I'm sick of chasing walleyes, so sign me up. <laughs> You have totally uh, transpired to the next level. So, <laughs> uh, dude, I, I, I want to chase. I, it's funny because like I've never, ever, ever claimed to be a walleye guide. I don't even claim to be a walleye fisherman, period. It's, I'm not great at it. But lately, you've been doing well. I've been really figuring it out. And there's technology involved in all that kind of stuff. So I'm kind of going the opposite direction where a lot of my clientele, the first four or five, six years of guiding, was pan fish. everyone wanted to book me for a, as a pan fisherman that's what they knew me as through the forum days and all that yeah. and then for a long period of time i've been doing a lot of bass fishing in the summertime well now i'm getting a lot of walleye conversation going on and it's kind of fun yeah i mean they're challenging they're different like it's not the same cup of tea as chasing a bass or anything else i mean like you have to think outside the box in other ways and and i hear the same thing from guys that go from walleyes and try to fish bass and so i mean it, one of the cool things about it you probably have it better than us in Bemidji is like we have the diversity of it. Like here you are chasing walleyes and bass and panfish and perch for decades as a fishing guide. And now you're like, I'm just kind of getting sick of it. What else can I do? Well, now you have eel pout, white, uh, white fish, tulabies, rock bass. You have all these other options out there that anglers aren't thinking about. And it just gives you diversity. Right. And I think as a fishing guide, I think that's cool. Yeah. You may have some regular clients that are like, me too. I, I want to go catch a tulipy. Yeah, and I'll keep your name secret. Yeah, that's <laughs> Thane. Thane would still not catch a tulipy. <laughs> no, I uh, I did. It's kind of funny. Like I, I think it was toward right before like bear baiting started because I kind of shut down the fishing guide service once bear baiting starts because we guide bears heavy. Um, but I was toward the end of like that walleye string where it was like walleyes thirty trips in a row, and I'm like burnt out and yeah i know where they are and we can go catch them but it was just like the same thing every day and it, we were starting to get into like the tika bite or the jig wrap bite you know so it was just like go watch people teach them how to snap jig teach them how to work a hard bait and then net fish and stab my hands for four hours or eight hours and i did a radio promo and we were trying to do like a discounted trip and i I punted on the original conversation and I'm like, you know what? Anyone who wants to go musky fishing with me next week, I'll give you half price and you won't catch anything, but we're going to have a, f- a fun conversation <laughs> and you might see some fish. And I just like, I get to the point where I need to do something different. Yeah. You and I are a lot of like, yeah. like I'm antsy. I don't, I can't do the same thing over and yeah. over and over and Dead over. Dead stick so. bites don't exist in my world. No, no, no. <laughs> it was funny. We were talking about that handful of us were talking about that yesterday about last year we went up and fished Drew's cabin and had fun and fished in fish traps. Mm-hmm. We did an evening fish house and I had a blast. I kind of forgot how fun it was. And I used to do that a decent amount, but you know, I find myself if, if I don't mark fish consistently, mm-hmm. I got to be moving. Yeah. I'm doing something wrong. Like even when I go to Lake of the woods every year with my kids, I know for 100% fact, like moving around is going to hurt me. Mm-hmm. It's going to, and I, and I don't cause we have rental houses, but I, I still struggle going like, this is the best way to fish this bite. Yep. Get it through your head, Matt. Don't want to move. It's just human nature. It's how I am. Yeah. I, I want to bebop around. 
Yep. Same way. I haven't fished in a fish trap in ages. Yeah. Like I love them yeah. and I get to know them inside and out and get to know the product well. And I love having my clients in them, but I'm, if clients are sitting in them, staying warm, I'm the one running outside, yep. checking the holes and all, yep. all you can sit on the fish house and I'll slide you over to the, to the hole I just found the fish in, but then I'm going to continue bouncing mm-hmm. around all the holes. What do you do when you eel pout fish, just fish from the truck? Um, if, if you're at night, if we can get a truck out. Yeah. But, but that's about the only time like tulabies and burbot are about the only times where I'm really stationary. Like, yeah. cause I know they're coming to that spot structure based. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and I struggle then too, because I'm not marking fish and I'm like, I know for a fact if you're, I went out like 12, 30 feet that way, 12, 14 feet deeper, I'd probably catch them earlier, but then I got to hustle to get back and it'll be about that time I'll run and then a client will catch a fish and. So you, you really got to discipline yourself to do, sit still. Uh, burbot during the day, they just go hang out deep, right? Yeah. They just go belly down and just don't move. Yep. Just chill. Just do nothing. Yep. Can you target those fish? During the day? Yeah. You can target them and won't catch them. They don't move at all? No. I'd like really? I, I've been able to mark fish and find burbot midday, but I can't catch them. Huh. I feel like every burbot I catch midday is accidental. And it's a really high, high roamer. Fish. It's yep. a high roamer that, and it's usually big. Yeah, you'll get it's those. It's not a three pounder. It's a six or plus. It's a big one. You'll get those mat burbot. Yeah. The ones that are antsy and they yep. want to move and they yep. want to go eat and, and they'll rise up off the bottom and they'll go chase tulabies or a school of bait fish or whatever. And you'll get lucky and, and you know, pop one 12 feet off bottom or something. Yeah. Wow. They're, they're never coming off the bottom. Well, I remember. We, we've been talking. Yeah. Yeah. I like, I brought home a trophy. Thanks yeah. to two burbot that just 10 dur- pounder during the day decided to roam around and you just don't find it very often aside from during spawn, you know, then you can whack them all day long cause they're feeding and, and it's bawling and spawning. But yeah, during the day they're just, it's like in the summer too. Like I've heard of people snagging a musky fishing, like on they're burning a bucktail and they snag a burbot in like <laughs> July. Like, <laughs> I haven't seen a burbot since March. Like, where'd that fish come from? Yeah, why don't people catch them as much in the summertime, open water? I think they're just out, like, in the depths, like 80 feet of water, belly down, eating whatever Cheetos and soda that people throw off the side of the boat. Hmm. <laughs> they just don't. Yeah, you're right. You don't hear, like, and like, lakes that have a lot of them. Like, even during the Mille Lacs heyday, mm-hmm. you didn't see or hear of that many caught. No. And you had thousands of anglers out there on weekends, and they weren't catching burbot. Even at night, fishing yep. slip bobbers. and Like you know, Gull Lake, you never hear of it during the summer. No. Leech, do you? I mean, I've never heard of it. Lake of the Woods. Rare. I mean, Very rare. Hmm. They have to go deep. The only, Interesting. only time I catch them midday in the summer is river systems. The river burbot, I think, act differently than than lake fish. So, Isn't Rylander related to them? Could we ask him? Yeah, I'm sure he would have the answer. <laughs> He's like, belly down, boys. Yeah, belly, belly down. down. That's what I do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he, he, would, he would tell you, that's how you get this. <laughs> yes. yeah. well, we were referencing Jason Rylander. If you heard us say Rylander, he uh, is one with the burbot. I think he said I got a burbot musk. Yeah. Just yeah. Google that. Yeah. First thing that pops up. It's his face. It's not laying, all, in a, just... laying in a pool of eel pout. Oh, my God. Looks true story. Yeah. True story. No, eel pout are pretty cool. I think, so you're going to do a, a seminar on undesirables. I think that's pretty darn cool. I, I, I think a lot of anglers should consider that because, like, a lot of people, whether they travel to some of these destinations or whether they have some of these destinations or opportunities in their backyard, um, take advantage of it. I mean, you heard us here talk about walleyes, right? I mean, you got seasoned walleye guide decades where walleye fishing gets tough. You know, I think too many anglers oftentimes want to beat their head against the wall because they have to catch said species yeah. where again, expand your horizons. We did that. We were on rush East and West rush doing a photo shoot this summer. And we had uh, it was a bass shoot or walleyes, whatever we had of our, a bunch of our, our blackfish pros out there doing things in town. And the bite was okay. Maybe bad for many people, right? Sure. It's just kind of non-existent. Well, the bluegills were going first part of June. Oh, yeah. And uh, the second, the second we were, quote, unquote, done, and people were starting to head home, I'm no idiot. I'm like, I'm going to go back out and chase bluegills. And we caught so many big ones. Mm -hmm. And here we were watching boats fish for bass and walleyes for six, seven, eight hours all morning through the early afternoon going, this is a tough bite. And here I am looking at bluegills 
all over the place. And I'm like, I know exactly. Take the opportunity. Yeah. That's, Go bluegill fishing. It was fun. That's something that definitely uh, has come to me with age is like, I've learned to be more of an opportunist, right? Like if I take someone guiding and we're out on a four hour trip and we're two and a half hours in and we've maybe caught one or two walleyes and I know it's tough and I know we're just going to struggle the rest of the time. I, I want them to have fun. I want them to maximize their trip. I want them to feel like they walked away with a good time and, you know, no, no amount of joking or good personality can make up for a really, really tough bite. Right. So I might go chase smallmouth and we beat up smallmouth for the last hour or largies or bluegills. Like, and I have a lot of people that scoff when I say, let's go chase bluegills because they think of like standing on the dock with their grandpa catching bluegills with corn yeah. and they're all these little bluegills and they reel in the first Bemidji area bluegill and they're like, Oh, this is different. And yeah, I'm like, got a yeah, forehead on it. Yeah. yeah. The, these are fish. Yeah. These aren't like, I think you're giving them a layup. Yeah. No, these are fish, fish like big. And we're fishing them like deep off rocks or deep cabbage beds and, you know, pitching methodically into certain chunks of cabbage. This isn't just like you're catching big, big fish for their species. Right. So it's like going out and catching three and four pound largemouth. Yeah. We're, we're not going to put you on, 12 to 13 inch large mouth. Like every kid catches one off a bank fishing right. by the beach with, yeah, no, I get it. That, Setting the hook on. is fun no matter yeah. what. Yeah. That's all there is to uh, it. Yeah. Like at the end of the day, like, and, and walleyes, let's be honest. And I'll probably get flame for this. The reason everybody loves eating walleyes is because they are the tofu of fish. They taste exactly like whatever you put on them. So your breading, your salt, your pepper, whatever. Walleyes don't taste like anything. Mm-hmm. That's why everybody loves them. And people hate pike because it takes like a fish, yeah. which is really weird to me. <laughs> yeah, like you're, I've, you're not wrong. I, I have argued with dozens of people that I have so many other species I would rather eat than a walleye. Yeah, I think the most like flavorful ones that I like are probably bluegills. Honestly, bluegills and perch for me. Yeah, yeah. Like, I like they got a, a w- good winter flavor time to catfish. It. Channel oh, okay. cat through the ice is my favorite. In the summer, I'll eat it. In the winter, it's probably my favorite thing to eat. Crappies and walleyes, honestly, those are close, I think. But yeah, I you're think right. Bluegills have a little bit of a flavor and the perch, like you but said. But you season them, you put stuff on them, yeah. they taste great. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I like the texture and the taste of fish in general. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. Pike, pike are so undervalued. Oh, I love And pike. everybody catches a two, three, four pound pike and they shake it off. They don't want it. Like, if you'd like to eat pike and you like the taste of fish, like, it's like I use pike mostly in chowder. Sure. Because of the bones and all that. And you can do the Y bone thing in the three cut. There's all kinds of processes you can look up. In fact, Caleb, one of our buddies on pro stab did a great video on how to cut up a pike, but I actually Cuban and flake them. Mm-hmm. I get all the bones out and I use all those big flaky pieces of meat and I throw it in a chowder. Yeah. They're great. And it's chunks super of meat. good. Like, super good. Every time, every time someone who's looking to have a fish fry in my boat throws back a pike, I'm like, Oh, you just threw away such a great opportunity. Like, <laughs> like even, even if you, like, even if you just cut the, the top half off, right. And you use that for something else, but you've got that giant chunk of meat that is just prime. Mm-hmm. Like eel pout. Yeah. I love eating eel pout and, and until probably like you said, 10 years ago, people threw them on the ice, which is now illegal. Oh yeah, you can't put them. You can't throw them on the ice anymore. I mean, it used to be you drive around Mille Lacs and you'd see piles of eel pout. I'm not kidding, piles of them outside of fish house colonies, yeah. frozen, and, and people would get a kick out of how big they can get their pile of eel pout. One way they would throw them. They weren't eating them. Right, wanton waste was yeah was like rampant. Now that we eat them, yeah, they're tasty. Or let them go. Yeah, let them let them get bigger. Like you even said, like Brett McComas, target walleye. That's like his thing. Yeah, like. Loves chasing big pout and they're big and they fight hard and they're challenging and they're they're predator fish. They're not they're not a bottom feeder. No, no. They're an apex predator. They are. Yep. They eat bluegills, they eat other eel pout, they eat walleyes, they eat everything that swims. Yeah, I'll have uh I'll have clients sometimes like they're throwing guts or whatever down the hole. Um and then all of a sudden they'll have a rattle reel go off at like three AM and I'll go check on them the next morning. They're like, Yeah, we had a rattle reel go off and Caught a bourbon and it was just full of guts. <laughs> Shocker. Yeah. Like, yeah, you baited that fish in, tangled all of our lines. We had to cut everything. I'm like, yeah, you did it. Yourself. Classic. Yeah. <laughs> it's the eel pout's fault. First eel pout I ever caught, 
I couldn't drive. I was might have been middle school, and I went to Malax Lake with my buddy Charles Speckman. If he's listening, he remembers this. We didn't know what it was. A rattle reel went off, mm-hmm. and it's amazing how you can sleep through a darn near atom bomb going off in your fish house. But the second, the first ding of the rattle reel, you jump out of bed. Yep. We get up, we get this thing. We were young kids. His dad's not moving, and we pull this thing up, and it was it was a big yelp out. I mean, we couldn't get, barely get our hands around it. And I remember grabbing this thing, and it wrapped around my arm. And I let go, and for a split second, this thing stuck on there, and Charles is beating it with a metal ice scoop. Oh, my God. We didn't know what it was. <laughs> we had no clue. That was an we alien thought, or something? We did. We thought it was some, this was not Someone supposed to happen. What did we catch? To the pet store and dropped off of Yeah. We're going to be on the news. Like, what is this thing? We threw it outside. We woke up his dad. He's, like, mad that we woke him up. And we're like, da, 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 Bob, 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 look at the. And Bob's like, you morons. That's a, you caught an eel pout. And we're like, what do we know what that is? Yeah. But, like, I remember we were legit scared for a period of time. Like, yeah. am I going to die? It wrapped around me. <laughs> what, else, what do we do? Yeah. Yeah, you'll about the acid from the, yeah. the acid slime is going to and it came up backwards. Poisonous. Oh yeah. So now we chase them like we go to Lake of the Woods and we actually give each other points. Me and the boys, you get points for fish you catch, and the eel powder worth more points than a walleye. I love it. Worthy because you only catch a few a day. Right. So if somebody hooks into an eel pot, someone hooks into a big quality fish, like even Brody or Ben, they'll be like, "I hope it's a pout." Yeah. We're most people are like, man, I hope this is a big eye. Yeah. No, they're like, I hope this is a big eel pout. Yep. Yeah. We usually catch a handful every time. They're pretty fun. Yeah, they are fun. How do you ca- how do you target pout? Or, or are we giving away all your secrets for your nine o'clock seminar on Saturday at St. Paul? Oh no. Um, I Just bait. I obviously Just most hooks. of the most of the season, like early, and uh, like early ice and and into mid mid winter even, I'll target them just like walleyes. Or even multi-species fish, like I'll be fishing, you know, for bigger wa- bigger walleyes or burbot, whatever bites, um, and that's kind of how I target them, like breaks and points and inside turns and humps and things like that. And then once I kind of my spider sp- sense goes off and I think the <laughs> the burbot might be transitioning to burbot areas, then then I start to work toward those and well, maybe touch more on that during seminar time. But yeah, but specific areas that you know have proven in the past or look good on the map um you know uh, shallow shallow water adjacent to very deep water like where these fish can slide up out of deep water and feed and do their thing talking like spawn or like chase like getting close to spawn close like yeah gotcha when 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 the feed bags start to really crank up and then and then into spawn and their bellies can't get any fuller right when you're catching burbs and you touch their belly and think they're going to explode. Yeah. Yeah. Those, those Burbit spawn is like March, right? Yeah, typically be, beginning March. of March. Beginning of March, yeah. yeah. And they pull on the humps and stuff. And yeah. Yeah, Some of the underwater footage I see is pretty cool. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's like sw- the swarm is the best term. Like swarm of Burbit eel balls. Pout. Yeah, burbot balls. Yeah, and you're, you're using uh, forward-facing sonar. So watching, watching them is really neat. On, on like live scope or or whatever you're, you're using but mm-hmm. it's so cool to watch them slither they're just such a neat fish yeah you catch a lot of your drew i've got a handful i don't i've never like gone out and targeted them i've got a really big one on lake of the woods same thing as you said there's a rock pile of sun going down walleyes leave and then one giant mark comes in and dunk you know like a 10 pound burbot and then uh on leech, I caught a big one too. I on a tip up. I remember we had. I have a funny like kind of clam story. Uh, I think I was guiding, and uh, and Mitchell was up filming with one of my best friends, Jonesy. Yep. And uh, Matsky had buyers up, and they were going to go fishing, and they decided to join us. So I was guiding, Mitchell was filming, and Matsky was entertaining, and I'm running like between all of these trying to guide for all of it at the same time. So I got my clients and then I'm trying to get Mitchell and Jones on the right spot. And like, I've never heard so much excitement and yelling come from several different fish houses. Like we were just set up on the, on the, on this large area. And like Matsky had one of the new houses at the time and it was just this monster of a house. And he had like nine guys in there and like every four minutes, like, just screaming and I'd run over to that house and then 
I'd try to run around Mitchell because they're filming and they're catching fish and back to my clients. And, and like, they're eel pod fishing, everybody. Yeah. And just happened to hit it right during spawn. And yeah, I think, uh, I think, I think it was maybe Shields Buyers or something Sounds like that. Sounds right. Yeah. But I think everybody in that house, including Lucas, caught their Lucas first. Lucas caught one? They caught their first bird that Jeez. night. Yes. Bite was good. Real good. I yeah. think the. It was really good. Um, the, if so, I'm not like huge into eel pot fishing. I would totally if I had more opportunities. But if I had to, I'd probably go to Lake of the Woods. I think just because they keep like breaking the state record there, and those things are huge. Yep. Like in the last couple of years, it's like it keeps getting one upped, and I think those guys are probably just walleye fishing and catching eel pout, right? Uh, some of them are targeting eel pout. Like yeah, the Macomas goes up there and specifically targets pout. I'm talking like the state record dudes, though. Well, I remember my buddy. Aaron Guthrie, who had the previous record, um, he caught his walleye fishing. Like he yeah. was, he was up there for a long stretch, kind of living in his fish house, just walleye fishing, yeah. watching TV, relaxing. And he caught it, and he sent a text to Rylander, and me and Jason were like, "Oh, that's big." And Jason urged him. He's like, "You need to put some shoes on and take that thing to town and get it weighed officially." And <laughs> it was the state record. <laughs> But that was on accident. He, yeah. he wasn't targeting them. Like, it could happen to anyone. Oh, yeah, for sure. The, there's fish in the basin. You and I are so different. Like, you want to go to Lake of the Woods to do that, and I want to catch them on these little ponds that nobody thinks they're well, on. I just think it's cool they're <laughs> giant. I don't know. I want to catch one on gull because of how they look. They're very unique. They're I like mean, they're leopard. Unique everywhere. I mean, they're, the gull ones are like... Very spotty. Gull. It's almost like it's spawned with a pike Yeah, they're cool. in, in look, obviously, like yep. collar pattern. Yeah, every lake is different. Like you get those. The leech like, one I caught was super leopard up, leoparded up. I think very that's cool. yellowish, probably. Oh, yeah. yeah, a lot of the ones I catch are usually on Lake of the Woods, and they kind of the have the, the pale, purpley. They're a brown, brown and white. Yeah, I mean, they're yeah. still cool looking fish, but like you get the ones on some of the smaller, smaller lakes, leech, gull, malax. They have a lot more color to them. Yep. Now those uh, those fish on Lake of the Woods. I know, like you get like the the Rainy River run, you get the lake fish and you get the river fish. Are the are eel pout doing that? I, I are you catching eel pout in the river too? Or are they mostly yeah, staying? I, in the we lake? got one in the river a couple years ago. But I feel like there's native river fish because yeah. even when you catch burbot in the river, they have a little different color than when you're catching them on the lake. Um, so I think some we, of those we fish caught live a burbot in the, in the rainy that was like the size of this board, it's tiny. Yeah, there's a lot of little. I, th- ones I was like, there. is that a bullhead? And we're like, no, that's a that's an eel pout. Yeah, there's a lot of them. When Wal- you're surgeon fishing, Wal- you, can bump into, yeah. you can bump into some pretty good numbers. There's some huge, uh, what what other fish are in the river? The white suckers in the Rainy River are giant. Yeah, and there's red horse in there red too. Red horse, those things are huge, huge too. Yeah, there's another, more undesirables. Yeah. Yeah, and do you remember Bobbo? Oh, yeah. And Bob, Bob Bolin? Yeah, Bob might be listening. Bob always tries to get me to go target carp through the ice. And I haven't done it yet. But I really want to, and he's kind of dialed it in. And sounds like a out. Bob Bolin thing. Oh yeah, for oh. sure. Huh. Bobby yeah. eats them things. Probably. I see Ron Rupp, his father-in-law, all the time. Just yeah. saw him the other day, and we took a selfie together, and he texted it to Bob. Yeah. But uh, Bob in his ha- in his day, it may, probably still is. I just don't fish. That dude was a tough guy to beat. You want to talk about the tournament scene? Bob Bolin, Travis Schlor, I think owned the UPL plaque for like five or six years of its existence. Yep. So those two guys could whack him. Mm-hmm. Now he's chasing carp through the ice. See, he's, he's chasing the, the undes- undesirables yeah. o- over the hill. Over yeah, the he's hill. like, oh, like I, I've, I've cashed a few checks and I got some plaques fishing yeah, these tournaments. I got a long for long 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 carp. I'm going to go chase carp through the ice. <laughs> what haven't I got? Yeah. Carp. Yeah. Uh, I know on the horseshoe chain where I spent a lot of time guiding, we chase channel cats. The carp and the suckers stack up. And a lot of people think they're chasing channel cats on electronics. They're not. They're chasing schools of carp, suckers, big mouth buffalo. I mean, they school up. Yeah. And they come through and swim oftentimes in little swarms as well. And people think, oh, man, a lot of times if you see this complete Heisman from a fish, it's not a cat. Most cats will at least stop and investigate what you're doing. Sure. But if you see these big marks come through and not even stop, from what I've seen on the chain, they're almost always other undesirables. Yeah. Well, Where the I, cats will slow down and at least go, oh, what's going on here? Smell it, use their body senses to see what's going on. Then they might move on. Yeah. Where carp and suckers, a lot of times they don't want anything to do with anything you got. They just, they're just moving through. Yeah. And 
I used to see that a lot, like back in my tournament days when I fished walleye tournaments, you know, you might sit on a school of fish for like two hours before you figure out there's suckers. I, while I fished up in Bemidji this in June, I probably spent so much time fishing for suckers yeah. with live scope. Oh yeah. And then I finally caught one and I was like, are you kidding me? I'm like, I, I spent that much time fishing for dang suckers. Yeah. You learn real quick when you, yeah. when you're fishing those lakes that are full of, them. Oh I'm my like, God. But I mean, it felt so dumb. There's got to be similar characteristics, uh, a few suckers on a spot versus a few. I mean, I would imagine, I mean, visually on forward facing sonar, they're going to have a very similar shape, right? So it's not like they're going to give you a, a sheep head echo. Yeah. This is they're, where you need a camera. Yeah. You need yeah. to drop down and see, but like I would do that. I would throw um, it in thinking it was a school. Oh, walleyes. you do. No but, questions asked. But then walleyes can be stingy too, where you're like soaking a leech under a bobber in front of them for like 15 minutes before they bite. Mm-hmm. You know, and you're like, well, a sucker kind of does the same thing. He just sits there and doesn't eat it. Yeah. So then you keep fishing them and then you catch a walleye. But there might have only been one walleye. That per, just happened to be swimming. Yeah, every yeah, 10 yeah. suckers. You're like, they are walleyes. And right. uh, Colt showed me some footage, Colt Ringer from Aquaview of like just a bunch of walleyes and suckers mixed together. Yep. And I'm like, you know, maybe that's what I was fishing for. I'm like, you know, what? I, I definitely was fishing for suckers the whole time. I was trying to catch walleyes. Yeah, yeah. Make yourself feel better. Ugh. No, I've, I'd probably fish a for a lot of suckers. Yeah. <laughs> I am a darn sucker. fish, especially with forward facing sonar. I mean, you, I I throw at like everything that looks like it's not a bluegill. I do. I mean, if I'm looking and scanning and this and that, and I see something that looks like a carp, you can tell. Like I've gotten pretty good at figuring out that's a carp. Sure, that's not going to eat taller or, or, or a musky, right? Like yeah, those are you you know yeah. what are, but like a lot of your largemouth bass, smallmouth bass, walleyes, uh, in many situations they look pretty similar. Sure carp or, or suckers other things like that we throw i always throw at it i've had things chase me around forever to the point where i'm like i hate forward facing sonar <laughs> yeah i have i have ruled it off some days because i chase too many darn fish that just don't want to eat anything i throw at them to go i'm gonna turn this off and i'm gonna go back to to what i know the, the pike the pike will always eat your bait though and they will always make you lose tungsten jigs yeah on forward facing mm-hmm. i've learned that yeah the hard way well, like Dave Gens says the best. Our best customers are pike. Oh my yeah. God. Clam. Yeah. Clam's best customers are pike because no they're kidding. just biting off your jigs and you got to go buy another one. Oh, yeah. You, you get to that like prime pike zone like the first week of June. Oh, and I'm still pitching jigs and shiners. And I, I'm i calling the front desk here like restock me on tungsten. I am in pike season. Like you cannot get away from it. I'll, I'll be pitching at like wads of walleyes on like a rock ledge or up on fresh cabbage and like the bait will hit the water and you just feel thunk, and you're like oh yep oh, gone dude. how gone. is the pike fishing by you don't want to talk about it i mean are there quality fish being caught like there are some or, or is it getting pretty i mean i know in the twin cities right now it's just two to four pound heaven like uh, the it's bigger fish are t- too is it yeah. but but you can i mean we we caught two giants this year um for the bemidji area you know they weren't like 20 pounders, but uh, Tate and I each caught one like over 35 inches. And in the Bemidji area, that's a really nice fish. Mm-hmm. And one of them was real girthy, probably 16 pounds or so. Um, you know, it's a it's a really big pike for us. But I remember before the musky population got really huge in Bemidji, like catching 38 to 40 inch pike in Lake Bemidji was not going to say it was regular, but you'd see maybe one a year. And that's pretty good. Mm-hmm. Uh, you just don't see that anymore. Yeah. Oh. Oh. But the musky fishing's good now. Oh, and the muskies in Bemidji are stupid. Like yeah. 55, 56 inches. Everyone, every, everyone is hearing about these every year. Someone's catching 54, 55, 56 inches. New potential world record was just caught recently. On Mille Lacs, Has it been that, verified yeah. yet? I don't think it's been verified yet. Last I looked, it was not. But, but, it, it, but it sounds like it's going to be. Yeah. What, how big was the one they caught on the St. Lawrence River? Wasn't that the... Is that the current world record? I don't know. This thing on Mille Lacs looked like a baby ship. Yeah. I mean, it was huge. huge. I mean, it's giant. And I, I got a, one of my friends, Luke Ronestrand. Um, he's a musky head. Everyone that musky fishes knows who Luke Ronestrand is. And I know Luke personally, and he's caught multiple state record muskies in his lifetime, but doesn't want to verify them. Doesn't want to go through the rigmarole of potentially hurting and or killing said fish. Um, that's just a, a humble shout out to Luke. I mean, there's musky guides out there I know that 
have probably touched a state record muskie. Oh, yeah. But in order to verify a state record muskie, and times may have changed. Now, this was when I was working at Thorn Brothers. I haven't been there in over 13 years. This was probably 17, 18 years ago. You had to pretty much bring the fish into a spot, which I'm guessing you still have to do. Correct? I mean, you have to actually bring a fish in to verify it for a little uh, Not to do the weight, photo anymore. It's for the weight of it. Photo, you just lay it on a bump board, right? And yeah. Just like a tournament. But yeah, you have I, to actually bring the fish in to actually get it weight. Yeah, you would How have, does it work now? I mean, you have to kill that fish ultimately? If you were doing, doing the full way... I, I believe you would have to bring, you'd have to kill that fish. And so bring this, it in so for this, the weight. person that's trying to get the world record muskie from Mille Lacs, that fish is probably gone. I think I mean, that one is a photo verification. Okay. Yeah. And, I, and I'm, I'm speculating. I'm not saying well, they, he did that they or did that. that one. Yep. Okay. They yeah. did. Cause it was the same guy who caught the really big one last year, right? Nolan Sprangler. He, he was with fishing with the guy who caught it. Okay. I'm pretty positive. Right. I believe so. Yeah. 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 So, and they, he talked about, cause I think the one last year died. Right, because they, it just something happened and the fish died. Yeah, yeah. And that happens. which can happen. Yeah, I mean, it that, totally happens. That's I mean, a it's a battle and a half. That fish is yeah. So they said fighting for its life. This you know? one, they like, they're obviously using really heavy tackle, and they wrenched the thing in, took a quick picture, and sent her home. What a big fish! Yeah, yeah. Muskies, it, muskies are very. I mean, the musky fishermen are unique. Yeah, mm-hmm. the fish itself is unique, like how fragile they are. It just blows my mind. Like to be that big of a fish, to be that big of an apex predator and to be that big of a wimp, it's just crazy to me. What's funny. Cause like <laughs> a lot of people say that about musky anglers and I'm not one, but I got a lot of friends that are musky anglers and they say the same thing about us ice anglers. Oh, for sure. And the ice anglers is a certain kind of creature. Right? You got to be certain kind of crazy to be an ice fisherman. Like, you know, and then here we are. I mean, I had worked at a musky shop. Like, yeah, they're they're a unique breed. Yeah, and I'm not saying it in a bad way. No, like, me neither. They they're, are they're, dialed. Oh yeah, like, like I I've they seen people possess something I do not. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, and it makes them yeah. amazing musky fishermen. And I've seen certain people post pictures of fish they catch on Mille Lacs or leech or anything, and other musky anglers say they've caught it. Because they can see a certain nuance of a fin. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah that's what was a 52. Oh, dude, they know everything. Yeah, they know everything. It's crazy. Like, imagine doing that on Minnetonka with a bass. Like, like yeah, oh, I cut that four pound nine ouncer. Yeah, I cut. No, you didn't. Like, if it was like chance. a, if it was like a seven and a half pounder, maybe you sure. Could, like, right. but no, not a chance. Yeah. Like a four pounder. We did no. catch the same smallmouth three times in Malax in one day. I know for a fact because he's well, hung up by a rock and they all get caught up. Came back like two hours. In Lacks in one day. <laughs> right. Uh, Good times, good times. What so? What are you planning to do this winter, man? Like, I know you got fish house rentals. Yep, you try, got you got try a handful, to recoup money from last winter. You got a handful <laughs> of shacks on Bemidji. I know you said it's starting to book up, but you have some yeah. openings. We have a few openings, especially midweek stuff. But okay. weekends are actually, I think a lot of people are extremely excited for ice this year because my phone has been ringing off the hook yep. and people have been booking. Um, a lot of people, not a lot of return customers, but also a lot of new customers that are relatively new to ice fishing like we just want to try ice fishing heard you were a great place to go so i've taken a lot of bookings already and and it shows me that people are amped up um we have a lot of space open for guiding right now like you know taking the side by side or the bear cat out and tate's gonna be guiding for me this winter his his first year he started during bear season so perfect um so openings kind of double with with him having some space when he's not at school or work and uh doing a lot of that and try to get some hunting in. We, we like predator hunting in the winter. and um, But that's going to be a high focus on ice this year. Try to try to get back some of what we lost last year, not just financially or, or you know, personally for fun, but like rekindle the love for mm-hmm. ice because I was sure angry at the yes. lakes last winter. So how, how can people reach you if they want to book one of these guide trips? How are they getting a hold of you? Yeah, so if, if they want to book with me or just have questions in general, northcountryguides.com. And that's also how you get a hold of Rylander. So if you want to go chase some burbot, you can uh, get a hold of him through us as well. And and some people probably want to go with Tate because the passion of a young person just getting into guiding is unparalleled. And you'll probably actually catch something. Right. You won't with me. <laughs> we'll just talk. Tate. I love Tate. Tate's awesome. I've got a chance to fish with Tate multiple times. He's friends with my son as well. Uh, beyond his years yes for sure he gets it yes and he understands all of it and that's important and 
and getting into guiding is not for the weary. No. No questions asked. And and he's got it figured out. Yeah, no. I'm I've, excited to see where that goes, man. I've tried to talk him out of it. <laughs> really? Yeah. I need to go grouse hunting with Tate. He needs to, he needs to teach me. Yeah. <laughs> Every time I see him. He needs to teach me. And dude, I considered like myself a lot of very good. Really? Oh, my God. He is insane. Yeah, like, every time I see a picture on social media of Tate, it's like him and some grouse or woodcock. I'm just like, dude, how are you doing that, man? Yeah, like one day he came home, and it was like him and his girlfriend and his buddy. And I'm like, how'd you guys do? And he looked at me, and he's like, we shot 10. I'm like, what do you mean you shot 10? I'm like, I haven't shot 10 all season. He's like, I was, we just hit a spot. It was good. He's yeah. so nonchalant. Tight-lipped or what? He just doesn't. No, he tells me, but it, he's just like. Yeah, this is normal. See, yeah. that's a good guide. He won't even tell his dad. Yeah, yeah. I, the juice. I told I told him he had to take me grouse hunting. He's like, sure. Yeah. <laughs> it's just I don't even know if get I've on seen my calendar. Grouse. Yeah, get on my calendar. Oh, that's Gosh. awesome. I'll give Tate a hard time when I see him. Tate will be at the St. Paul I show as well with Matt. So you can pick Tate's brain on grouse or anything else. Um, that rhymed. That was pretty cool. But uh, we're to probably do some fishing this winter, I'm sure, at some point. What do you got else on the docket? You got any trips planned? Are you going anywhere fun? Ice I, fishing, or are you just gonna kind of? Well, you live, you live where we want to go. Fund ice fish. Yeah, so you're kind of spoiled. I, I do want to get up uh, to Whitefish Bay. Um, yeah, my, my friend Robert. I haven't been able to see him the last few years, so I want to get up there and get Tate up there and introduce Tate to some Laker fishing and and some good Robert humor and some Rebecca lasagna. Some of the best humor. Yeah, up at Vic and Dots. Uh, so yeah. that that's one trip we have planned, and then uh, I've got work stuff like uh, I'll be in Vegas for Shot Show. Um, that's something that's on my calendar every year and, and taking kind of handle business while I'm gone. But, yes. uh, but that's always an exciting thing, but no, uh, no getaways mm-hmm. this year. I think, uh, going to concentrate on just keeping the rentals running and pe- people on fish. Well, as I alluded to earlier in the segment, the show, I got a rock bass bite down in the cities. So if you need a getaway, yeah. there's a couch in my basement and we can chase some big rock bass. Is it the same couch I slept on? Not a, <laughs> not a chance. That's still at my parents' house. So if Grandpa Tom's listening, uh, yeah. We talked about some stories we couldn't mention earlier in the podcast. That is one of them. Yeah. We'll leave for imagination. All but, right. Hmm. But, uh, yeah, come on down. We'll chase some Morocco's Twin Cities rock bass. Well, I know we're going to bug you at one point because Tate really wants to go to Horseshoe. Yeah, he love it. He really wants to hit Would the love chain. It. So, yeah. I'll bring Jack and we'll go chase some horseshoe chain catfish. Yep. Should be good. I mean, the nice thing about the last couple of winters, in my opinion, if there's a silver lining with, let's call it two back-to-back tough winters. Two years ago, we had all the snow. Last year, we just know what happened. These fish are pretty unpressured. Yep. I know my spring crappie fishing this year was the best it's been in a long time, and I think that has to do with these schools of crappies. Let's, let's be honest. A lot of the crappies in our lakes get pulled out in the wintertime. Mm-hmm. It's not during the crappie spring bonanza. It's during the winter months yeah. is when a lot of our fish get pulled out of the lakes. Uh, and, and it hasn't happened. No. So on a lot of lakes that I targeted this spring, I saw my average size crappie noticeably better. Sure. And I think it's going to move into, I think we're going to have phenomenal winter season. And for those of you that get out fishing, and I encourage everyone to do it, get it back on your list of things to do, you're going to see that your average size fish even on these quote unquote popular lakes is going to go up. Yeah. And I think it's going to be worth, worth the effort. So I'm excited to get back out this year just because I think we're going to see better sized fish and in the horseshoe chain too. Those cats got so much pressure prior to the last couple of years. They had so much pressure. I mean, people are starting to figure it out. They're starting to enjoy it. They realize it's a lot of fun. They taste good. They're coming out with buddies. They're staying overnight for well, the last couple of years. For the most part, that chain's been untouched. Sure. And anglers are not keeping these cats in the summertime because they're a nuisance. In the summertime, they disperse. They're everywhere. You catch them on a top water. You catch them on a crankbait. You catch them skipping a the dock. You catch them on. In the winter, a little, little less spread out. They taste good. And that's when anglers are actually targeting them. Yeah. But they had two winters to relax. Yep. So you need to come down. We'll try to catch a big one. Yeah, and I would invite myself to go somewhere with you, Drew, but you just want to come up by me. I do. I know. I, can I just sleep <laughs> on your couch? Yes. <laughs> I'll eat Terra Thai or whatever in Bemidji. Me and Tate will go grouse hunt and whatever, fill up propane tanks on ice houses. we got plenty of space for you to sleep. Yes. Yes. So I have two places now I can stay in Bemidji. Perfect. Love it. Holmgren's and Brewers. Just depends which one I want to hang out with. Yep. 
<laughs> uh, boy, I can only imagine the the excitement and shenanigans you guys will get into. You know, Bemidji's a pretty special place. Yeah, it is. Let's call it what it is. Well, Matt and I were talking at lunch today. We went to lunch, and my son, Jack's a junior, same age as Tate, and he's thinking about colleges, and I told you this. That's top on his list right now. Yeah. It's, and, and it's because of a good school. It's a great school. You went there. I mean, it's a good school, uh, but he's an outdoorsman. I have to correct you. I went to UND. I ended up in Bemidji. Yeah. But, uh, but I you started in UND. I, yeah, I, I ended in Bemidji, but, uh, but I, I, I'm, I'm a UND guy, so I, I can't, I can't let that one slide. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I'm trying to talk Tate into Bemidji. Um, you know, for, for kids who love the outdoors, if they can stay disciplined and not just hunt and fish every day, well, you can still hunt and fish every day oh, as sure. long as you go to classes. Uh, unfortunately I do see a lot of people come to Bemidji for college and they only make it a year or two because they get so caught up in the outdoor lifestyle that they forget about school. So, you know, I'm not trying to. So, so I'm going to talk Jack out of it. <laughs> I'm not that it will hundred percent be Jack. Not trying to let my parenting <laughs> side come out, <laughs> but yeah. Any but it school, really it's like, you know him. Yeah. <laughs> Any school outside of the twin cities, you got pretty good options actually for outdoorsman stuff. Mm-hmm. Even yeah. Southern Minnesota, there's some sweet stuff. Oh yeah. I had, yeah, I had know. a blast down in Mankato. We had lakes all over by us full of amazing fishing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but yeah, you have some discipline. Yep. You got to remember, you got to put, set your priorities straight. Yeah. You know, but I mean, he is excited to hear and explore the opportunity. And, and of course, right away you mentioned Tate. Well, I'll be close to Tate. Like, you know, we're going to go fishing all the time. Like <laughs> you twist, each, <laughs> yeah, twist each School. other's arms. Yeah. But uh, U- unique thing about Bemidji is it's, on the lake Mm -hmm. like you literally sit in class looking at the lake so like if i gotta handle that can you still put your fish house on the lake sleep in it during the winter to not have uh, an apartment bill and then commute up to you could because that's that happens and you can park on the lake like you remember where i used to live i i used to use a north access baja across the lake and park and go to class and it would save me like 10 minutes because i didn't have to go through all the stoplights and traffic like yeah it's unique in so that way. So much traffic in Bemidji too. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, you must have high blood pressure when you come down here. Huh? It's so bad. It's St. Cloud. And like, like oh, I had I had to stop in Monticello and take extra medication to get to climb headquarters. <laughs> no way. Oh my god, <laughs> no, it's not that uh, bad. But it. there's like one stoplight. You know, a couple of people crossing the road. They're putting roundabouts in Bemidji now. We're like evolving. Game it's over. Crazy. Jeez, yeah, Jack's not going to Bemidji for, State. Yeah, no. we're gonna start fishing for rock bass next yep. thing we know. They're gonna start stocking them. <laughs> yeah, we stock rock bass in the pond down by Bemidji, by the Park, roundabout, Bemidji Park <laughs> County Field. Yep. No, that's cool. I've been up there a bunch, fish with you a whole. You are right. You got a lot of fun stuff up there. I mean, I would get, I would get lost in the opportunity. Yeah. You know, and I remember when we were younger in college, we used to fish all them little dot lakes. Yeah. We didn't even know what half of them were named. We named them ourselves after we decided either they were absolute garbage or something special. Right. You know, we have one that's named BFC. <laughs> It's yes, an ac- acronym for big something crappie. Right. Mm. So speaking of which, is that ever turned back on? It's good again now. Yep. Okay. It it, it actually got a beating for a while because uh, someone opened up some access on it. What? Yeah. So It, it got, took us a Hail Mary and a prayer to get to that spot. Yeah. And now, and now that is closed back off. So the fish kind of recouped and there's, I don't know if it'll ever be like it was. I, well, it won't be. Like that was unique. That was the find of the century for me. I, I'll never find a lake like that again. I'll never have that much fun and be able to share a bite like that with so many people. Um, but but it's come back and there's still a good size in there. We went back to Jonesy's house just because it felt right to go someplace, but we didn't sleep. Yeah. Because we just wanted to go back out there. Yeah. They were all big. How big think, were they? Oh, Red Lake. It's got nothing on this lake. Well, yeah. How big were they? Like 15, 16, 16 and a half. Like when seven. you caught 16s, you were like, ooh, we should get a picture of that one. Yeah, 17s, 17s. I saw, the biggest I saw was a 17 and an 8. So. Yeah. It's a big black crappie in northern and, Minnesota. And, and it wasn't like a one-off. Like you had just caught a 16 earlier or 15 and 7, seven ace. Like, so it wasn't like you're catching 13s and then you catch a 16. Yeah. It was and, like, and they're built different. Like you, you see the Chronicles chasing these 16 inches and they're phenomenal fish. 
but they're hybrids. Yeah, they're you yeah. get a seventeen inch pure black. It's an absolute gorilla. Mm-hmm. What's it's like the whole... biggest crappie you've seen up there, Brewer? A straight black crappie, obviously. That's like seventeen and an eighth. Seventeen and eighth. Yeah, and that was uh, it was caught by someone who might be listening, uh, Dieter von der Marwitz. Mm-hmm. Um, and Dieter has kind of tinkered in and out of the the industry a little bit. He worked um, at some. Actually, he worked with Studer way back in the day, um, and it was like the first time he, he's South African, mm-hmm. and he brought his brother, and it was the first time his brother had been on the ice. And hearing someone when you drive onto the ice tap you on the shoulder and say, "We're on water," like <laughs> it was crazy. But but they melee him, and that was that was the biggest crappie I've ever seen in person. Jeez. Yeah, he's not wrong though. Like that was like if you caught a thirteen, you're like, "What are you doing here?" Yeah. Like giants, two pounders were every day. Yeah, you, multiple. You twos. did not catch like elevens. Like yeah, twelve and a half was about the minimums. But the work we put in to find that lake and to get that was lake and, like number six in three days of us, like lifting four wheelers over logs because we can't get through. Right, and and this wasn't like the first time we tried it. It was like the fourth attempt of many many lakes over and over and over again, but. So much opportunity up there between like the public land hunting and the little lakes and the potholes. It's like you couldn't do it all in a lifetime. No. Literally. Yeah. And no. Literally, you can you know? leave leave my house and hop on a trail system and drive all the way to Canada and hunt public land almost the entire yeah. way. So it's pretty cool. When you're when you're bushwhacking into back lakes and Matt wishes he brought his pistol because we're seeing like wolf tracks and dead deer carcasses torn up by wolves and I, at the time i'm this city kid call it what it is thinking like what the hell am we getting into here like and you're like yeah this is probably bad because like that's fresh like that blood's fresh like there's a wolf by us right now so i'm like <laughs> i didn't bring my piece i'm like uh should we turn around <laughs> <laughs> oh <Just> dude <laughs> lots of good memories lots yeah. of good memories getting s10 stuck and stuck in trees because Matt said my truck will fit and his won't. Mine didn't fit. So another, it's fine. Yeah, it's okay. No big deal. That light replaces itself. But uh, memories, that's what it's all about. Yep. Like we, we created a lot of memories. We continue to create memories. Drew and I have created a ton of memories, a lot of great fishing trips. Tate's going to create memories with his buddies and now it sounds like his clients. Um, at the end of the day, that's really what all this is about. I mean, everything we reminisce on, everything we talk about is you go fishing because you want to have fun and create a memory. That's the nature of the beast. It is. So, yeah. dude, what else, man? Anything else you want to send our listeners on? No, I just I hope, of wisdom. I hope people are excited for ice. I think it's gonna be a great year. It's gonna be nice to get back out, and there's a lot of awesome new products out, and a lot to be excited about. I mean, after like you said, a couple of tough years, I think we're we're due for a really fun season. Mm-hmm. I think we're there. Yep. But come say I'm at at the St. Paul Ice Show if you're there. Give them a hard time about rock bass. Or talk about rock bass. I don't even care. And uh, we'll have a good time. So on behalf of Drew, Matt Brewer, myself, thanks again for listening. Another episode of the Ice Team Podcast. Ice is coming. It's not far away. We'll be on the ice here very soon. One of these future podcasts in the very near future will be actually talking about being on the ice. Go out there, have fun, be safe.